The Federal Reserve System, known as the Fed, is the central bank of the United States. As a central bank, the Fed provides services to financial institutions and to our federal government. The Fed has a lot of responsibility for keeping the U.S. economy on track. It promotes the goals of maximum employment and stable prices. The Fed also supervises and regulates banking institutions. It does this to make sure our banking and financial system is safe and sound. The Federal Reserve System includes the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System in Washington, which has seven members, plus 12 reserve banks that serve different regions around the country. The Federal Open Market Committee, known as the FOMC, is the group within the Fed that sets monetary policy. The seven members of the Board of Governors and all 12 Reserve Bank presidents, including those who aren't voting members, attend FOMC meetings. Though they all participate in the discussions of the economy and policy options, only the seven members of the Board of Governors and five of the 12 Reserve Bank presidents are voting members at any one time. One of the five voting presidents is always the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. The other Federal Reserve Bank presidents vote on the FOMC on a rotating basis. If you live in the United States, the U.S. economy has a big effect on your life every day. The prices you pay for clothes and food, whether a parent has a job that can support a family, or a good teacher or firefighter loses his or her job. These are all economic issues that affect you. There's no way the Federal Reserve could fix everything that might be wrong with our economy. But it does contribute in many ways to making the economy run better. One of the Fed's main responsibilities is monetary policy, which affects interest rates. And interest rates can affect a lot of things, including how many people are looking for work, how fast prices in our economy are rising, how fast our economy is growing, and ultimately, our standard of living. The Fed also supervises and regulates financial institutions, making sure they're solid and are contributing to an overall stable financial system. The Fed is even responsible for many parts of our payments system, including making sure millions of electronic payments get cleared each day, government payments get made, and coin and currency are available to the public through the nation's financial institutions. You can inflate a basketball with air, but in economics, inflation means a rise in the general price level of all the goods and services produced and sold in an economy. One of the causes of inflation can be too much spending chasing too few goods. In other words, the total demand for goods and services in the whole economy is greater than what the available resources can supply. Another cause of inflation is called an inflation shock. In 1973, an oil embargo caused a dramatic rise in oil prices. Because so much of the economy depends on products made from oil, the result was higher inflation throughout the economy. There are several things that can lead to inflation in the short run, but long-run, sustained inflation is caused by excessive growth in the money supply. This is why price stability is so important to the Federal Reserve, which can control the growth of the money supply in the United States. The word unemployed doesn't just mean out of work. The official definition says someone who's unemployed must have no job and also be actively looking for employment. The unemployment rate doesn't include people who have a part-time job but really want to work full-time, or those who have given up on looking for work. During and after the financial crisis that began in 2007, unemployment hovered around 10%, which is higher than normal but not nearly as high as around 25%, which it was during the Great Depression. One of the main goals of the Fed is to promote maximum sustainable economic growth. Part of that phrase is easy to understand. Of course, you want economic growth. If the economy is growing at a reasonable rate, people are better off. So why not just say the Fed wants maximum economic growth? Why sustainable? Well, it turns out that when the economy is growing fast, total demand in the economy for goods and services may be driven beyond the economy's productive capacity. This imbalance will drive inflation up. Why? 
because a too hot economy is like a car going too fast on a curvy road. The curves are inflation. When inflationary pressures appear to be mounting, the Fed can raise interest rates to push the economy back towards its maximum sustainable rate of output growth. So, maximum sustainable economic growth is achieved when the economy is growing as fast as it can with full employment and low and stable inflation. For the Federal Reserve and other central banks around the world, smoothing out peaks and troughs in business cycles and long-term economic growth are important objectives. It's no secret that the economy seesaws up and down over time. Some years it's booming, other times it's not doing as well. A business cycle refers to these ups and downs in economic activity. Business cycles vary in length from peak expansion down to recession and back up again. Peaks occur when economic activity has reached a temporary maximum. Recessions are periods when the economy's total output declines, usually for six months or more. Troughs are points in business cycles where real output reaches its minimum. Recessions are followed by expansions, which are periods when output is expanding above the previous trough. Employment often tracks along with real output, decreasing during recessions and rising during expansions. For the Federal Reserve and other central banks around the world, smoothing out peaks and troughs in business cycles and long-term economic growth are important objectives. As many of you know, interest is the extra money that your money earns when you put it in a savings account. In other words, interest is what a borrower, in this case a bank, pays a lender, in this case you, for the use of the borrowed money. But where does that interest come from? How can your bank afford to pay you more than you give it and still stay in business? Here's how. If you kept your money at home under your mattress, it wouldn't be earning any interest. But when you put your money in a bank, the bank in turn loans a portion of it out to others at an interest rate that's higher than the interest rate it's paying you on your deposits. It usually makes a profit from those loans. These profits allow the bank to give you interest as payment for using your money. Depository institutions like banks, savings and loans, and credit unions, do a lot of things. They take deposits and make loans, channeling money from savers to borrowers. They also offer services like checking accounts, ATMs, online banking, and exchanging foreign currencies. In addition, they may issue credit and debit cards, offer all kinds of loans, like for home purchases, small businesses, and autos. They may even offer insurance and investment products through their non-bank subsidiaries. Depository institutions may pay their customers interest on their deposits, but they charge more interest on loans they pay to their depositors. They make money on the difference between the interest rate they pay and the interest rate they charge. If a bank pays 2% a year on a $1,000 deposit and charges 12% on a $1,000 loan, at the end of a year, they will have made $100 from those two transactions. If you've ever used a credit card, you know what credit is. It's getting a loan to buy goods or services now and paying for them later. Credit is based on the idea that you can be trusted to borrow money now and repay it in the future. Credit is vitally important. Businesses rely on credit to expand. They often rely on credit markets to pay for their operations when they're working on long-term contracts. Individuals rely on credit to buy big ticket items like houses, cars, and appliances. And without credit, would-be homeowners would have to save up the entire price of a house before they could buy it. That's a huge undertaking, which could take a very long time. Liquidity is the ability to quickly convert something of value into spendable money. For example, 
a savings account has lots of liquidity for an individual bank depositor. The depositor can get cash with a quick visit to the bank or can move the savings to a checking account with a click of a mouse. A car has much lower liquidity. An owner can convert a car's value to spendable cash only by selling it, which can be complicated. Just like individuals, banks and other financial institutions sometimes need more liquidity. A bank may have valuable holdings like sound, well-secured loans, but payments on these loans come in only periodically. So the bank doesn't have immediate access to the amount of the loans. Because of this, it can face liquidity troubles if many customers try to withdraw their deposits in cash at the same time. In ordinary times, banks and the Federal Reserve work together to make sure there's enough liquidity. But in a crisis, liquidity can dry up. Then the Fed works to restore liquidity through its discount window or other lending programs. The lender of last resort is usually a country's central bank. In the U.S., that's the Federal Reserve. A lender of last resort offers loans to depository institutions like banks that are experiencing difficulties. They make these loans against high-quality collateral, which are assets pledged as security for the loans. While depository institutions usually look to borrow from one another when they are short on funds, they might turn to the Fed's lender of last resort function during a financial crisis or a national or regional emergency, where financial institutions' failure to obtain credit would have a severe negative impact on the economy. Right after the 9-11 attacks, banks and financial institutions faced major disruptions in their vital interactions with each other and their customers. The Fed lent billions of dollars to many of them on a short-term basis. This kept financial institutions working and helped restore stability in the nation's financial system. In the financial crisis that began in 2007, liquidity dried up and credit markets seized up. To prevent the financial crisis from becoming a financial disaster, the Fed needed to act as a lender of last resort. It made fully collateralized loans to many financial institutions through its discount window and other lending programs. Government securities like these are certificates of government debt. Now, if I buy some of this debt, it means I'm lending the U.S. government money. For example, I can buy a bond from the U.S. Treasury. If I hold it for several years, then cash it in, the government will pay me interest. I'll get back more than the purchase price. The interest you earn on U.S. government securities isn't as high as the interest earned on other investments. On the other hand, it's a very safe investment because it's backed by the U.S. government.